diplomat, mm -hmm. and so well, you know, French was instrumental because it was right. the language of diplomacy um, until recently. Mm -hmm. And uh, I didn't even know that. Yeah, that makes sense. <laughs> it does. I'm not even yeah. thinking about it. And uh, and then I um, then I started working at the, at the at the state. But you know, I um, I'd like to think that I'm a diplomat in a different movement in a different way. In a sense that I go around the world promoting not only my winery but my appellation. So right. this is what that's I. That's fair. That is yeah. a very good point to look at it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I mean without the bureaucratic part, right? <laughs> which is in the in diplomacy. Well, it's nice. it's in diplomacy nice. nowadays. Yeah. Is a good part, right? <laughs> yeah, because uh, yeah, I'm I'm like thinking about it, and I mean honestly. I tried your, I mean, we tried to line up last week, Richard and I, and, you know, bring um, your Chianti Classico on by the glass, or one Thank of you. yours, and they all were fantastic, in their own way, which yeah. they should be, you don't want all your wines to taste the same, yeah. so it's very interesting, again, just the fact that you're like, yeah, because you talk to other wine winemakers or, or winery owners, and they're like, yeah, I kind of had to get put into it, like, I didn't want to do it, I wanted to do this, but it was my fate, so I just kept the family business going, but you, you were like, nope, I went to go learn political science, but you're putting out wine mm -hmm. that is incredible. All of it's really good. So it's really funny to see how you are, you can be a jack of all trades. It's not just for the wine world, but just yeah. anything in general, which I think is good for people to hear. Um, you got hobbies, you got things you got to do, but in the end, yeah. you can find a nice harmony for it all. Oh, yeah. It can become a beautiful thing. The Romans always had an intellectual activity and a, and a practical activity. Right. So Judas, Judas Caesar, for example, was a very good carpenter. Right. Mm. It's very important to have both. I'm learning so many new my things. My grandfather was a carpenter. Hey, Everyone well. in my family was a carpenter. Did you try to conquer, you try to go conquer France? No, he should have, though. <laughs> he should have. <laughs> no, nah, he's from Sicily, so they wouldn't have let him. Back then, in Italy's name, they would have been like, no, you can't do it. You know, you're not one of us. You Beautiful know. region. Yeah, I can't wait to Beautiful go. Beautiful region. I haven't been to Italy yet, so which is a shame, because my dad's full Italian, and my gra his his mother's from Naples, My uh, his father's from Sicily. Which part of Sicily? Um, you know? Palermo. Yeah. yeah, so uh, I can't wait to go. I was supposed to go in 2020. Uh, yes, for when you go to Palermo, you're supposed to have the street food, the pan and I, I can't wait. The, I can't wait. With the, with the, with the spleen. Yeah. yeah. They have a sandwich that's that's awesome. spleen. Well, they have, they have the one with the spleen, and then there's one that has just everything in it, too. Yeah, it's like, like snout uh, and yeah, cheek yeah, and yeah, everything, yeah, awful, yeah, awful. which typical people would be like, ugh. I'm like, please yeah, give I me all that. of it. Yeah. I, that's the purest expression of Sicily I'm going to get. Is it that sandwich? Except for Mexican restaurant, because at Mexican restaurant you find a Mexican, they like a, you know, like a taco place. But the only place where I had a sandwich with all full in the United States was in, um, in Philadelphia, the Italian market. In mm, South, uh, South, that makes sense. In South, Philly. South Philly's got a great Italian yeah. culture. Yeah. They are, yeah. I can't, that's another place I want to go. Because I went to, I mean, I've been to Brooklyn. My father's from Brooklyn. Right. Um, South, uh, North End of Boston? North End of Boston, I can't wait to go. And then South Philly, I can't yeah. wait to go to. I'm excited to see all that. And then you get to see, like, how different they are. Mm. I mean, they're still Italian-American. Yeah. But it's Philly. It's Boston. Oh, yeah. It's mm -hmm. Brooklyn. So everybody's going to be a little different. Right? It's, it's like Chicago. Accents. You go to Chicago and they make deep dish pizza, which I despise. But <laughs> it's still like, hey, you know, it's your thing. It's what you guys do. You know, somebody in your family maybe got hit in the head <laughs> when, they, when they came over here. But it's okay. You know? Or they were just really hungry. I guess. <laughs> yeah. Because to me, I'm like, that's casserole. We'll call it pizza, pizza. <laughs> I guess. What in Chicago, right? That's funny. Awesome. So, next wine, Chianti Classico. Most important wine I make. Most, it is. I mean, most, most I, would, I would probably agree. I, I don't know anywhere near as much about Chianti or wine in general as much as you do, because I live life with a white belt mentality. That's, that's how I enjoy to live life. Um, always want to learn, and I try to learn as much as I can, but when you're in it day to day, you know significantly more than I do. So, and everyone here knows Chianti is Chianti. We've all heard the term, whether sure. it was from um, Anthony Hopkins in the movie, or whether it's from just going out to Italian restaurants, or you just had that one bad right. Chianti in the straw basket. Everybody right. knows what Chianti is. So, why is it the most important? Everybody for you guys? thinks they know. What yeah, that's true. They think they know. Because it's the first day with a customer. It's a, usually when this is the, mo the, the wine I make the most of. And you know when people uh, buy a bottle of my wines, ninety percent of the time will be the Chianti Classico, and uh, or when they or when they find it at a restaurant, and so it being a first date with a customer has to be good because you know as a lady in this room can confirm, if the first date is not good, there's no second date. So <laughs> better be good, better be good. Uh, it's our staple. The label that you see was uh, created by my mother in 1962, is actually the family coat of arms, 
uh, that she kind of that's what we were about, thinking about yeah, that that yeah. she made in a kind of a modern fashion and so this label has been around for more over 60 years now wow. okay that's yeah. awesome and um, the um, it's a Sangiovese 90% with a 10% Canaiolo Chianti Classico is the true right. wine in a sense that's Chian the, made in the regional Chianti the regional Chianti it's one of the oldest, it's the oldest appellation in the world because the borders of the appellation were established in 1716, so 30 years before Port, which was in 1746. And, uh, so Port is the second oldest? Second oldest. Oh, I never knew yeah, that. 746. That's cool. Yeah. And, um, and the, uh, but the problem was that Italians are not people that plan. We adapt. <laughs> yeah. We have lived the moment. So what happened was... There's no other way to live, though. There's no other way to live. During, during immigration, Italian uh, um, immigration from Italy and immigration in the United States, uh, the Italian community, of course, created the Little American cuisine. And what is the base of Little American cuisine? What the people in Philly call the gravy or New York. Gravy. The, so the, tom the tomato sauce. So good. And the tomato sauce sings with Sangiovese. Mm -hmm. And so Chianti became hugely popular at the end of the 1800s and beginning of the 1900s, but the region of origin could not meet the demand. And so there's always been a practice of making the wine the same style of Chianti in my region uh, by, by um, kind of neighboring uh, areas. And, um, and uh, so the, the, basically the wine, because of the, the, the original region could not keep the demand, was started to be made all over Tuscany mm -hmm. and shipped to the United States, and not only Tuscany, I may say, and shipped to the United States in, uh, from different harbors. And so the Americans would drink the Chianti with the name of the harbor where it came from. So they would drink Chianti Naples if it came from Napoli, mm -hmm. Chianti Genoa if it came from Genova. And, and they started making Chianti wine here in, in the United States. Still nowadays, you can go to your local Publix, Piggly Wiggly, Harris Teeters, and buy a jug of Carlo Rossi Chianti yeah. that is made in Central California. So my grandmother drank it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> they always had a jug of it. Yeah. Because the wine completely lost a sense of place and became a style of wine. Yeah. And the, the producer from the regional area from where everything started did not fight this practice. They only woke up in 1924 by founding a consortium for the defense of typical wine of Chianti and its trademark, which is the Black Rooster. Right. But it was too late. Yeah. Because already looking at 50 years of gain rights, the government wanted to push the sale of Chianti because it brought fresh cash into the country. And so, basically, in 1932, established that the region of Chianti, of production of Chianti, was much bigger than the original region. They threw us a bone by saying, you are the original ones, you can add to your wines the adjective classico. Because classico, in the Italian appellation system, means the original place. Right. Mm -hmm. Palpolicella classico, soave classico, Chianti classico, and Orvieto classico. And so the... Um, Nowadays, we'll, we're looking at two appellations that are called the same, Chianti and Chianti Classico. And one appellation makes about 30 million bottles and makes wine for mid-term, long-term aging. And another appellation makes 100, more than 100 million bottles for ready consumption. You know, very, you know, you put it, the, the, just the date of release. The date of release of Chianti is usually typically the 1st of March after the harvest. Right. The date of release of Chianti Classico is, usually, is one year after the right. harvest right. and typically as an average, you won't see a Chianti Classico before a year and a half on the market. Right. I mean, there are some few wineries that will put it out after a year, but very rare, right. very rare. So, so it's, it's a completely different way of making wine. So, again, for, for, the, for the viewers, and I know this, but can you tell them the difference between Classico and then regular Chianti if it's from Tuscany, not if it's Carlo Rossi? Or of course, of like course. Because I've had... I accidentally ordered one time for the restaurant regular Chianti. She said it was Chianti Classico. It wasn't. And I remember opening it and I was like, that's not, that's not good. <laughs> yeah. So the, uh, the, the bylaws mandate for Chianti Classico that has to be 80% Sangiovese and 20% of other red varietals. You, in, in Chianti instead, uh, the bylaws have been, are changing. Uh, they've reduced the amount of Sangiovese now the, to 60%. When was that? Uh, recently. Like wow. a few months back. I don't know if there has been approved. I didn't know that. It's a proposal, I don't know if it's been approved. So wow. it might be on the, on, uh, on train de, so all about to be approved. And then they uh, increased the re residual sugar uh, up to, I would say, 
big grounds, if I'm not mistaken. Oh, okay. So, so it, it's, a, it, it complete, is, it's a completely different approach in a sense. Uh, there are two markets of wine. There's a fine wines market and a beverage market. Right. Mm -hmm. they have two, the two markets have very specific rules. You cannot belong in both. You have to decide which market you want to belong. You want to belong to the beverage market, then you have to follow what people want. You know, you right. have to, you know, understand the trends and uh, uh, try to anticipate the trends. And so, if people want, you know, Sauvignon Blanc tasting of grapefruit this year, we have to make it tasting of grapefruit this year. Right. And then you have the fine wine market where you try to make the wine that comes from your land and trying to find the people that like that kind of wine going around the world. Of course, there'll be less of them. There'll be less of them. And so it's a, it's a, it's a completely different approach. So I think that the difference nowadays between Chianti and Chianti Class is Chianti is definitely, appellation is definitely veering towards the beverage market, whereas Chianti Class was definitely veering towards the fine wines. So that makes sense. Which, all right, so this makes me curious then. The 60%. If it passes, um, the fact that it even got discussed about is very interesting to me, um, because you think Sangiovese, I think Sangiovese, I think Chianti. Mm -hmm. That's what I think. It's it's everywhere in Italy, but I think Chianti um, or Tuscany, and I would assume that uh, maybe not you, but other winemakers might be a little upset that it's getting kind of because it seems like it's almost like a eh, it's okay, just drop it. That's what it sounds like to me. <laughs> like there's that that um, that identity is kind of just kind of being a little pushed to the side. Um, so because it used to be ninety, right? No, a long time ago wasn't it ninety uh, or something uh, like that? No, no, it was ninety was the maximum. Oh, the maximum. Okay, yeah. But Silly. eighty is like to you me. You couldn't do one hundred percent. That's right. Until in Chianti Classico, you couldn't do and two hundred percent until ninety. Right. That's what I'm thinking of. So that, and then you have eighty, which is, I mean. 80 20, that's a good rule. Yeah. But anything below that, I would. Well, 20 could be 90 to 10, and it could be 100. Right. I mean, um, 80 is the minimum. Right. But I would think anything below that is almost like pushing it in well, a way for, for the identity of Sangiovese and Chianti Classico. But it's, you being. You well, know, Chianti Classico is not, uh, you know, not part of this because. Well, true, Chianti true. Is, is, well, Chianti in general. Chianti is, in general, probably because they're veering towards a different path. You know, they're taking a different path. They think that's probably. The, uh, they should have more leeway in the making of the wine and probably adapt the wine to the, what the market needs. Sure. Oh, that's yeah. crazy to me. And the resi I mean, it's the true residual though. sugar goes into the same direction. You gotta, you gotta sell the wine to keep the doors open. Yeah, yeah, yeah that makes I mean, sense. Everybody's it does. gotta make money. It yeah. does. It's just, so, yeah. and then, you know, well, I'm you, definitely only drinking classic. If you notice <laughs> in certain markets, like in uh, Monopoly, Sweden, uh, he, I, was, I was looking at the shelves and the amount of... Uh, of repasso so there was on those shelves mm. it was mind boggling. A lot. Yeah. A lot. It's like here everyone here asks for Amarone or no, Ripasso. So because people, you know, always say, you know, people talk dry and buy buy sweet. Mm -hmm. I, I, I was just gonna say that. So many people all the time like I had a I had a lady at the at a restaurant at the restaurant the other night at Bastone. Um, she typically drinks um, Amarone. She wanted Amarone. Bastone is our um, is our uh, Neapolitan restaurant mozzarella salami bar so we don't do anything that far up no, because it's, you don't it's need gonna, to it's gonna crush everything. exactly <laughs> so and people get upset at that i explain it to them and then they go okay that makes sense so unless you have a very strong cheese right so she um so we were talking and i was like well what else do you enjoy and she's like oh, i kind of like pinot noir too i was like great i have a so have you ever had a not so and she's like no i haven't i was like let me bring this to you because i love introducing pinot noir to Gaston and also um so I bring it to her, and she tries it, and she's like, it's good. So they order the bottle, and then they finally get the bottle. I check back on them 10, 15 minutes later, and I asked her how it was, and she's like, I had to give my glass to the other person. It was a little too sweet. I was like, what? And it was so sweet. I was like, okay, for an Amarone drinker. Yeah. <laughs> I was like, but that's what it is. Maybe she drinks only bone dry Amarone. I guess. So, so, I well, guess. She has a very refined palate but, she does that. There are a few. There are a few of those. There are, there are. There are a few of those. But when but she said that, I just... Far between, but there It's are. one of those where you just, you just smile and go, okay. <laughs> <laughs> I'm actually surprised. That's funny. So what is your... Um, out of all these things on the board here, what's your ideal pairing for this guy? Uh, I would go with the Pecorino. The Pecorino? That makes yeah. sense. Okay. I would go with the Pecorino. Yeah, yeah right up there. Yep. That's a good look at Pecorino. I've never seen... I saw the name. The um, the, the sparkling will go well also with the goat cheese. With the goat? Yeah. Oh, yeah. I'm excited to try that. Right. What is um? We did uh, we did an event once with my cousin. My cousin owns a cheese and provision store in Hudson, New York. 
and uh, she's a cheesemonger. Uh, she used to work at the uh, Calgary Creamery in uh, Tamales, oh, yeah, yeah. California. And um, she's founded the first um, magazine on cheese called Culture here in the United States. And she had different, she did different things, you know, she opened up a cheese store in, in Chicago. And now she has this, uh, this store. And she's also an editor of the Oxford Companion of Cheese. So wow. we did a, 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 a tasting, wine tasting with cheese pairing. Mm. It's not immediate. I mean, you have to really go through all the cheese and taste all the yeah. wines because it's not cheese and wine. Yeah, they work, but you have to really... A lot of people just assume yeah. cheese and wine. Yeah. To make it sing, like, it's got to be a pretty specific. Yeah, yeah, there is. It's just like, I, I tell people it's kind of like, cheese and wine is very, very specific to, to kind of like just seasoning your food in general. Like, you put the certain seasonings together mm -hmm. to accentuate each other. Then you add the salt, which accentuates everything else. But you put that one wrong spice in there, or that one wrong herb mm -hmm. it's gonna throw comp everything completely off balance yeah. and all it takes is just one little bit of it yeah. that's why i tell people all it takes is just you like this for instance mm -hmm. if it was pecorino that's not pecorino romano but if you maybe did pecorino romano you may not like the pairing right. but this pairing might er, this pairing to me is delicious but that's what like a lot of people just automatically go oh, i'm gonna go buy meat and cheese for the, for the wine night and i'm like whoa which one like, relax yeah, yeah, yeah like what are you getting and then uh, me because this is my job they're always like don't be such a snob. I'm like, I'm not being a snob. I just want to enjoy my time. If we're going to spend money on it, let's enjoy our time together, right? Yeah. So I'm, I'm glad you guys brought the meat and cheese too, especially because, like I said, we know meat and cheese mm -hmm. kind of here, but you guys live that shit. Like, <laughs> for, I mean, it's it's part of the culture there. It's, yeah. So it's always fun to hear from someone because you hear all those myths, like, don't do this, don't do that. Oh, that's not there, you know? But when you actually hear from someone who lives, you know, over in Italy... Or people who have been to Italy and things like that, and you'd be like, "Oh, you wouldn't believe I went over there." And do you believe they actually do do this? And I'm like, "Yeah, we've been trying to tell you guys this whole time, but nobody listens." But all it took was from someone from there to tell you, and now, now you're a believer. Okay, that's funny. That's so good yeah, because you experienced it exactly. You she experienced and it's um, yeah. it's, it's a different, different story. It is. It can be and for some people. It's a very religious experience. Oh yeah, it's, oh, it's very beautiful. romantic. It is absolutely. All right, so. Next. Gran Selezione. Gran Selezione. So the category was introduced into the appellation in 2014. Um, it mandates that you can only use uh, your own grapes to make the Gran Selezione. Um, so you cannot source out no grapes, no, no wine to make it. And, uh, um, and it, in my case, in my estate, there was not enough. You know, it's, uh, the box needed to be full or filled with some more content. And I went, I, I went a completely different approach on the Grand Selezione. I chose three different vineyard sites, what the French call a climat. And uh, I vinified the, those three vineyards exactly the same way. So I don't want to, in this case, I don't want to show my ability of blending like I do in a Chianti Classico and Chianti Classico mm -hmm. Reserva. I want to show people how Sangiovese changes depending where it's planted. Mm. Because Sangiovese, like Nebbiolo, like Pinot Nero, like Nerello Mascarese, it's a transparent grape. So it changes depending where it's like Nero Davola, it changes dramatically depending where it's planted. And, um, and so, um, the, uh, in my case, my Gran Selezione, so let's say my Reserva is my best blended, mm -hmm. if, you, if you use a whiskey simile. And my grand selection are my single malts. So that's, right. that's okay. the approach. That's, approach. That, that's a very good, I don't know why I've never thought about talking about it like that, but that's a very good way to put it. Now, the new changes that have been approved today, so we have announcing this today. As of today? As of today. You heard it here first. Of them this morning. Yeah. Through yeah. the grapevine. <laughs> I got a, got a phone call from the president of the consortium of Giovanni Manetti from Fontoli. He told me that. Oh, from Fontoli. Okay. Yeah. That uh, the bylaws that we, we propose have been uh, accepted by the committee. And so they'll be published uh, probably, hopefully next month. And this by these changes are affect Gran Selezione, Gran Selezione. From now on, will be 90% minimum Sangiovese, and 10% if you want to add them only re only local varietals. So no Colorino, uh, Canaiolo, Colorino, Canaiolo, Mammolo, Sanforte, Nera, Sinera, Mitello, Manbrada Nera, Foglia Tonda. There is a list. There's no a list. Merlot or anything like no that. Merlot, no Merlot, no Cabernet, no Syrah. Love and the uh, second it. thing that has been introduced is the village system. So, Ooh. like in Burgundy, uh, Chianti has been divided in 11 villages. The appellation Chianti Classico has been divided in 11 villages. And uh, those villages will start, you'll start seeing the name of the village on the label. 
and uh, for the time being it's only in the Gran Selezione level but soon I hope will trickle down to Chianti Classico Reserve and Chianti Classico. The 11 villages are San Casciano, San Donato, Creve, Montefioralle, Lamole, Panzano, Castellina, Radda, Caiole, Castelnuovo Radenga, and the difficult one to pronounce, Vaglialdi. Oh, that is hard. Yeah, yeah. That's, that is hard. <laughs> that'd be a hard, that'd be a hard one. <laughs> that is going to be tough. That's funny. I, speaking of Lamole, I, and Fantoni, I love his filetta di Lamole. Yeah. That is such a fantastic wine. And I the, love that expression of, of San Giovese. And my area and Lamole's area, Lamole Monteferale, are the smallest of all these villages. And they are the, probably the ones that have a, Lamole, it's basically on one type of soil. So the wines are very strong uh, characteristic in the sense that uh, you can tell them when you taste, when you smell a Lamole, you can tell it's a Lamole. Mm. It's very telling, you know, how the way it behaves and the way you feel it in a palate. And then Monteferrale, also because Monteferrale be a little bigger, but basically it's basically on a couple of soils, not more. Right. And so um, you definitely have a, some characteristic, strong characteristic on the San Giovese Monteferrale as well. This is where we are. Which is the main thing to me is that certain saltiness because Monteferrale, our village, is all on calcareous soil. In the southern part, there's a more sandy soil, so it's a, a stone called Pietraforte. In the northern part, it's a stone called Alberese, which is more on the, yeah. on the clay and and, and, uh, and silty soil. That's what uh, that's the that's the one Chianti is known for. Yeah, it's Alberese. Alberese. Yeah. Yeah. It's, a, it's a white limestone. Right. That it's typical, but it's in the in the northern part of Chianti where we are. It's only Monteferrale. Okay. To find it again, you have to go south. Can you um, explain to them quickly the differences in those soils that what it imparts into the wines that are from those areas? Sure. Thank you. Uh, typically, when it comes to uh, to soil texts and affecting San Giovese, I'm, I'm generalizing, of course. Uh, when it comes to color, the sand will give the lightest color to the wine. Mm. Then silt will be a little deeper, and mm -hmm. clay will be even more deep. In terms of tannic structure, the, the sand will have the finest tannins, right. then the silt, and then the clay. In terms of acidity, the sand, you feel it up in a high cheek, mm. whereas in usually in the, in the, in the silt and the, and the clay, you feel it more more here on the, on the side here. It goes very high, high cheek. Yeah, that's what, how I tell if it's a, it's a sandy soil or not. That's usually what I, wow. I look for. No one's ever taught me that. And I, never, I haven't read that before. That's, that's very interesting. But it makes sense because I mean, when you drink Nebbiolo, it's yeah. all here, mm, yeah. all here. Yeah. Same with Alvinale. Nebbiolo, Nebbiolo is, I mean, Barolo is mostly on the clay or silty soil. Exactly, right. There's very so that if you find one sand, you have to go to Loero. In fact, the, the Nebbiolo changes come dramatically. Right, right. yeah. And same if you go up to Lombardy and Battalina and all yeah. those areas yeah. too. I love introducing people to Battalina because Nebbiolo from Battalina is totally different. Totally, it's yeah. still Nebbiolo, but it's totally different totally from different, what people are used to. So I always love doing side by sides for people that mm. I love Barola. I only drink Barola. I only drink Barbaresco. I'm like, are you sure? Because you might want to try this one too. Because with that dish, you don't want Barola. Yeah, but it's like you know, I love Young Frankenstein. I watched that movie like ten times. <laughs> yeah. You know, I can't. You know, there are a lot of movies. To There's watch a lot of movie movies. Yeah. World. So you know. Um. So I'm curious because a lot of people don't know how much. Um, so Italy, in my opinion, makes the best wine, hands down. Um, Chianti is one of my favorite wines, if not my favorite, most quintessential wine. If you put a gun to my head, if I had to choose a red to drink for the rest of my life, it's probably Chianti. Um, Classico. It is. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Now. Classico. No. <laughs> Classico. <laughs> There's a, we, we usually play a game. Every time we have sommeliers coming and they say Chianti, instead of Chianti, Classico is like beer pong. They still have to jug. <laughs> have to jug <laughs> That's, <of> wine. Funny. <laughs> That's funny. I'm going to actually never miss that ever again. <laughs> <laughs> never again. Uh, but a lot of people don't realize how much of an influence the French have had on the Tuscan region as far as Super Tuscans and all that stuff go. Because you do have your Molo here, your Super Tuscan. Sure. Um, and I remember hearing one time about how, I don't remember how long ago it was, but how winemakers from Italy would go to France to, to learn about the Merlot and all these other grapes and the blending techniques. And then they came back and eventually Super Tuscan somehow got made, Sasakaya, all that stuff. Yeah. Um, so can you talk about how how France has influenced a little bit of Italian wine culture or vice versa and things like that? How you guys kind of discuss things? Because 
a lot of people, and we joke about it all the time, being Italian, Pat and I both were raised where we're like, fuck everything French. Forget everything French, right? And Rachel's French of descent, so we, we joke around with her and things like that. And But a lot of people don't realize how much the relationship there actually is a very harmonious relationship in a, in a oh, way, yeah. especially with the wine. Oh, so yeah. can we talk about that real quick? Because oh, yeah. I probably am going to learn something right now, too, that I didn't know. Yeah, so, I don't know, but do we want to taste the the French grape? Yeah, we might as well. Right? Yeah, yeah, we might as Before well. Before we taste the French grape, I forgot to mention that this is Vigna Bastignano. This is Epitome Monteferrale. So the soil I was describing to you, the limestone, this vineyard sits on that type of soil. So okay, this is, cool. If you want to have a, an idea yeah. of what San Giovese from Monteferrale tastes like, this is the vineyard that you should taste. So this is really That's killer too. Yeah, Did you try me on that one last week? No. Oh. So the only one that we uh, have in market at the moment is the Chianti Classico. Which is, by the glass at Bastone. Go drink. The other, <laughs> the other four here um, are previews as to what's to come. Okay. Awesome. Those, so, they're all so good so far. So the, the story of the Super Tuscan uh, stems from the fact that there were, um, the bylaws were kind of strict back in those days. And oh, yeah, people that's, that's could not, uh, before the IGT system was introduced, you either made DO, DO wines or you made table wines. Right. There was no nothing in between. And so, uh, was it also Vino Tavolo back then? Or? Vino Tavolo, yeah. yeah. Uh, and so the uh, many winemakers started making wine and following their own women baggery. You know, they wanted to use, uh, you know, French varietals. They didn't want to use Sangiovese. Remember that in those days, you know, Chianti was uh, there was a lot of uh, uh, unfortunately the Chianti Castro was suffering from the fact that yes. it was not an appellation on its own it was still an appellation depending on Big Mother Chianti and Chianti was having market problems because of the over overproduction so there were a lot of people saying I don't want to do Chianti Classico anymore I want to do my own thing I want to use 100% Sangiovese I want to mix it with Merlot and Cabernet and so and they started making these wines. You know, the first most famous one, of course, is Salsicaia, which is in the 60s. The first actually super Tuscan in, uh, in our territory was uh, Vigorello from, uh, from uh, San Felice. Okay. That was the first super Tuscan in our territory. Um, I believe it was nine, I believe Vigorello first vintage, I may be mistaken, I believe it's 68 or 69, something okay. like that. Um, and, uh, and so, you know, all these wines were on the market, they were costly wines, and they will all come from Tuscany. And this English journalist invented a term, to say, well, we call them Super Tuscan. But the Super Tuscan, there's, it's a marketing term. There's no codified, codified rule to establish what a Super Tuscan is. It's a wine that is made in Tuscany, and it's wine that, and it's wine that is very expensive. That's the, the, the two rules. It better be, it's got the name Super. Exactly. I, I thought, I thought it, did Maremma not have a DOCG for no. No. Super Tuscan? No. Yeah. Okay. no, I think... No, no Bulgari, no whatever. Yeah, Bulgari, yeah, yeah. yeah, Bulgari, yeah. You have Bulgari DOC. Because yeah. then Sasakaya got their own DOC. Yeah, right. Oh, DOC, not DOCG. Right. Yeah, they're, they're just a DOC. Yeah, still DOC, yeah. yeah they yeah, haven't yeah. done the, the DOCG passage yet. Interesting. Yeah. Uh, Do you think they'll ever get it? I think so. Yeah. Uh, they'll probably... And the name, yeah, yeah. prominent. Yeah, I yeah. mean, if they want it. If they, I don't know if they want it, you know. Yeah. yeah, yeah. That's fair. Yeah. Because with DOCG, when you pass from DOC to DOCG, you have to put stricter rules. Right. Production, you know, like production caps, yield, yeah. uh, exactly. Yeah, you have to yeah, put stricter rules. Site, or, uh, vineyard yeah. sites, all that stuff. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's to, for example, um, the main difference, for example, from between a, a Prosecco Doc and a Prosecco DOCG, in the Prosecco Doc, only the grapes are, uh, there's a, the, are the origin is guaranteed only on the grapes, mm -hmm. that they mm -hmm. come from the area. But the wine could be vinified in Piemonte or somewhere mm -hmm. else. Okay. Whereas the OCG, the Valdo Biadene has done everything in, yeah. in the area. So the wine, when the wine is ready to be drank, it gets out of the area. Right. That's usually the main difference between the OCG, the OCG and the OCG is that one. Okay. So in, uh, in, in our case, uh, back in those days, we didn't make any Super Tuscan. We have planted this vineyard in 1967, meaning to plant Sangiovese. But we, there was a flood in Florence in the 4th of November 1966, and the flood affected the whole city, but not only the city, also the, the whole uh, um, kind of um, estuary of the river, which is near Pisa. And on the estuary of the river, 
there is uh, all the nurseries. So all the nurseries got invaded by the river, all the name tags got washed away. Mm. And in the spring of 67, there were first contribution from the European community to plant new vineyards. So there was a huge demand of vines, and the nursery owners didn't know jack what they had in their vine rows. So I think San Jose is there, I think, uh, you know, Canaiol is there, I think Malvasia is there. And, um, and they ended up selling to producers like my father and others, stuff that was not meant to be. And so in the 67, we planted about 14 acres of vineyard, thinking we were planting San Giovese, Treviano, Malvasia, Canaiolo, we were planting Gewurstramine, Grechetto, Vernaccia, Tirol, De Gomot, Pucciano, Abruzzo, Ancelotta, and this bridal here. The, this bridal though was not readily recognized. They thought it was some kind of black mountain. My father's agent, you know, said it's not Canaiolo, it's not San Giovese, it must be some kind of Malvasia native. Nobody questioned that statement for 30 years, Thirty years later, I started a program at the University of Florence with an amplographer, Dr. Bandinelli, to help me go through all the vineyards to salvage all the, the material, because I grow more than 20 different varietals, and I make three of them, I make single bottling. Is right? that common? No. No, right? Okay, I didn't think so. I, have a, I make a single bottling of Mamolo, I make a single bottling of San Forte, and a single oh, bottling wow. of Oculus. So those are the three varietals that I vinify and bottle on their own. I'm assuming I'm going to come to you to go try those, right? Uh, no, they're actually in the, in the States. Okay. Not here, but they're no, in the they're States. Probably New York or Cali. Or uh, San Forte is a bubble. Um, and uh, Occhio Rosso, for all things, the sommelier in New Mexico got really behind it. and they most Really? Of them <laughs> crushing it? To Santa Fe. Yeah. Oh, wow. Interesting. That's weird. Is there a big wine scene in New Mexico? In Santa Fe, yeah. Okay. Well, yeah, I guess it's a metropolitan area. Yeah, yeah. 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 That makes sense. There's a um, very nice scene. That's very, very nice. Cool. Somebody has seen there. And anyhow, anyhow, in 1996, I discovered, thanks to the help of the amplographer, who was an expert on vines, that this was not Malvasia. It was not Malvasia. It was Merlot. And I was shocked by the news because I was very young and rash and adamant in telling people I would never plant a single international variety of my estate. <laughs> and there it was, planted well, right to my birth. Yeah. Okay. Well, at least you couldn't control it. No, it's, <laughs> it's kind of obvious. Gambito will join them. Yeah, right. And 1997, the following year, I started making my first and only Super Tuscan. And I started making a Super Tuscan 20 years later than the old phenomenon started, mm. so when the phenomenon was already on the dwindling side. That is funny. So, do, sorry, go ahead. No, I was just going to say, we uh, haven't been talking a lot about flavors since on, this, on these two reds, but this one, I'm going to have to maybe start talking about it because the, the nose on it's, this is really it's definitely I mean it ain't remarkable. Remarkable. so it's great it, the nose is fantastic the amount of uh, broken leather and um, rich stewed fruits coming out of this is it just does kind of sound like smell like going into like a horse stable in a way which is funny because you typically get that at Chianti yeah Plus, Plus, we were Plus. actually just talking about uh, bread on right before here and I don't I would not consider this like super bread tea but I would definitely consider it like you know it's got that really organic kind of uh, hay hay sense and, and yeah. you know on the farm kind of thing going on and yeah it's it's extremely rich which so is amazing I always I, I mostly only drink Italian wine I mean the, the restaurant group we only do Italian wines um, I grew up only drinking Italian wines I don't necessarily I love wine, but I don't necessarily care to learn about other wines. I just, Atlanta doesn't really have an Italian wine person, so I'm like, you know what, I guess I'll take that role. Um, but I have been introduced to some very good uh, Medoc Merlots and things like that from a buddy of mine who does. He loves Italian too, but he does enjoy French as well. Sure. I just don't go buy French. But I always, I've only had maybe two or three different Merlots from France that were like true, like really good crews. Um, but to me, and I have nothing really to compare it to, but Tuscany's Merlot is always just incredible. Yeah, it grows well. It's it's so good there. Yeah. I don't again. I don't study French wine, so is is a, is it the terroir? Is it very similar to like the French? No, no, no. no right. No, no, no. That's what I would think. Well, so. no, in a sense that the Merlot thrives on, on clay. Okay. Got mm, it. Clay. That's, so that's that, why. That makes that's sense. why it's planted on the right bank, not on the left bank. Mm, that makes sense. That's why, why you have Cabernet Sauvignon on the left bank, whereas sandy soil. Cabernet Sauvignon does not need more tannins. Right. Merlot does need to build a tannin mm -hmm. structure, mm -hmm. and that you do that on clay. Interesting. And the other element is that um, Merlot, in my latitude, needs cooler exposure. So, uh, southern, western exposure are not good for Merlot. 
northern and eastern exposure. Interesting. Thank God this vineyard planted by mistake was planted on the northeastern uh, mm. slope. And so it does work well. And you have to consider, you know, think about this guy. He's French. He moved to Tuscany when he was born. And he's been living there for, what, 50 years? Yeah. So his accent is bound to be more, you know. Yeah. It's like your, <laughs> your fiancé that lost his accent coming to Atlanta, his mm -hmm. British accent. Same thing, you know. His accent is bound to be more Tuscan than French. So that's why you get a little more... Um, Tannic, yeah, more a, a, a tannic resemblance to San Giovese. Yeah, I guess you, to know, a, you just adapt, yeah. you adapt to your to your surroundings. Exactly. So, um, another question I got then is, now that we're done through the reds, which one? It's like asking who's your favorite uh, child. But which yeah. one do you reach for on a more? I hate asking favorite because everyone goes, <laughs> I can't have a favorite. I don't have a favorite. So, which one do you reach for more often? Oh, the one I drink more often is that one. Classical. Yeah. Okay. Okay, so what's your favorite? <laughs> killer, a, a killer pairing for this is a duck and orange. Ah, oh, I can see that. Okay. Yeah. Killer yeah. pairing. All right. The, the, the pairing. citrus, like the stewed yeah. citrus. Yeah. Oh, yeah. And then, and then this one will be uh, like wild boar, ragu, that kind of thing. This is yeah. Really good yeah, so that. last year, Chef made um, a wild uh, boar ragu with the coco tale belly. Uh -huh. and golden raisins and it was it was one of my favorite dishes he did all year and that you're correct right. well, what, without a doubt would be fantastic and another one dish that goes very well the is the, the chocolate dish like um, mm. yeah, we, have a, we have a we have a wild hair that we do in a chocolate sauce in Tuscany Boche Forte or we do either wild hair or wild hair as in rabbit rabbit yeah okay thank you yeah that's yeah. rabbit people like big, big, big <laughs> rabbit <laughs> Wild hair. Oh, or, a hair is a big rabbit. Oh, it's big, big. I never much, really realized much big, that. Much bigger than a rabbit, yeah. I just always thought it was another term for a rabbit. Okay. No, no, it's, it's a much mm -hmm. bigger animal. And Or you can do, oh, they do it with wild boar. Wild boar, uh, this sauce, Dolce Forte, it's a Renaissance sauce that is made with chocolate and, um, and, um, and vin a bit of vinegar and, um, and raisins. And mm -hmm. Okay, so almost yeah. kind of similar to what yeah. Chef did. Okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Whereas for the Chianti Classico, the pairing would be for me uh, tomato sauce, maybe. Spaghetti, yeah. Spaghetti pomodoro. Pie. Yeah, that's it. That's it. No, yeah. not, nothing more. Yeah. And uh, on the on the sparkling, you'd be surprised. I think if you have a grill, if you like have a steak or something like that. I love sparkling with steak. That, I think that will. That's one of my favorite well. things to do is sparkling with very fatty steak. Yeah. A lot of people don't think about it because it's sparkling. I, and I I would not have thought that. I know. I know sparkling and fried chicken. I do love sparkling rosé and fried chicken. Stars. Sparkling rosé and fried chicken is the best thing almost ever. Yeah, <laughs> it's so good. I've never tried that. Because you have solid fat, you don't have liquid fat. Exactly. And then, then you need the acidity to cut through that solid right, fat. Right, so. yeah. Oh, it's the same reason it's Emilio, Emilio Romagna, you know, was known Lambrusco. for, yeah, sure. Lambrusco and all their sparkling wines and that, yeah. that whole area, the Germanics yeah. and everything kind of meeting yeah. with the Romans. So that's why I love teaching people about that part, about uh, Emilio Romagna being half Germanic, half Roman, right. and you have the Lambrusco, but then you also have the still wine, and why they were there, because of olive oil and because of animal fat. It's very cool, people don't think about it, but when you tell them, a light bulb just goes off in their head, and you're like, makes sense, right? This is why we pay attention to what goes good with our food. Cause so what was the, what was the, in your opinion, what, what, what was more before, the egg or the chicken? So was the wine adapted to the food, or was the food adapted mm. to the wine? So I always said that, the to me, for, as far as I know Italian culture, again, I'm Italian-American, but um, I think that the, the wine gets adapted to the food. The wine adapted. I would think, because we've been eating for forever. Granted, we've been fermenting things forever as a, as a species. Um, but in the end, the most important thing is to be able to eat. It's not to be able to drink alcohol, at least. Unless um, you can't drink the water. Right. But for the most part, I would assume that anything that was getting fermented was also it wasn't still it was still infused mm -hmm. it was i mean you took water you you fermented it to check it if it was clean to drink mm -hmm. and then if it grew mold or anything then you were like okay we can't drink this water now we got to do something with it to be able to drink but by then you were already still eating food you were mm -hmm. you were hunting a mammoth or whatever mm -hmm. so to me i definitely think it's more of and no one's ever asked me that so i thank you for asking me that i think point. i think the food had to come first because also if you think about it, again, the way I think about Italian food and drink culture, 
I feel like food's just slightly more important. Wine is important. You know, I, I always joke around and say Campari and soda is my blood type. Right. But, <laughs> but like, all those things are important. Aperitivo hour is important, whether it's vermouth or Campari or anything like that, digestivos. But to me, the food is number one. Mm-hmm. That's the most important thing that needs to be on the table. Then the family around the table. Because, and then you choose what to drink. Because what you said just about wine and food applies to olive oil as well. Exactly. Mm-hmm. Olive oil mm-hmm. changes depending on the, on, on, on the, on the cuisine. Mm-hmm. And so you have lighter olive oil when you have fish. fish. Mm-hmm. And you have kind of hearty olive oil like in Tuscany where you have beans and meat. Yep. So we, um, it's funny you said that because we, we try to use, are you going to get any other olive oil? Do you ship? I don't know. Oh, we do have an olive oil. You have olive oil. Do, yeah. you, do you ship it over here? We do. Okay. We do. Chef always, we love to get olive oil specifically. Mm-hmm. We try to from the wineries we work with. Um, so we'll have to get that figured out. But we just got in uh, Rocco de Montegrossi. Sure. Um, we Michael. just got in their olive oil. Uh, he was actually here yesterday. I met him. Uh, Marco's here. No, not Michael. Um, Marco, no, no. Wait. Marco? Marco? Marco is the owner. Uh, do you buy it from the, uh, the distributor? It was Marco, yeah. It was Marco. Yeah, hey. so, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, <laughs> Yeah, he was a great guy. Nice, yeah. nice guy. Um, so he's intense. Yeah, he is. I love. I loved it. I was. Like, <laughs> he's just, just like this the whole time. I was like, I like this guy. <laughs> but uh, we just got their olive oil, and I haven't tried it yet. But the, all the chefs at the restaurants, they opened it, and they were like, "It's green. Mm-hmm. It's spicy." And I'm like, "I love spicy." All right. I know. Me too. The spicy is better for olive oil for me. But but one of our restaurants is Alici, which is mm-hmm. um, our Malfi our Malfi Coast inspired restaurant. So when they said that, I was like, all right, is it going to go all right with the fish here? I was like, okay, well, gonna smolder it. I was like, it's going to smolder it a little bit. I mean, maybe a swordfish or something steaky or yeah, bigger, right. but, and I guess if we're putting a putanesca or whatever, right. you could just quickly drizzle it. But I was thinking, I was like, uh, it's not going to be the best thing. But at the same time, it's like. But if you're already thinking that way, you're already miles ahead yeah, of yeah. average person. Right. And which is fine because, I mean. Let's be real, Mild. and people are listening. They don't. They're not gonna taste it, but at the same time, it's something to take into consideration. Always, no, no, just like if you were to drink a wine. No, they're not gonna taste it. But you know, you, in fact, that you're thinking about that, yeah. it's, it's it's important. Well, you have to. I mean, that's the problem. Because with, you know, most of the olive oil that you find, unfortunately, even nowadays uh, in restaurants, is rancid. horrible. It's so bad. It's rancid. It's cut with vegetable oil. Mm-hmm. It's just it's and, not. and it ruins the plate. And it does. you know what? Alaimo, which is the, the chef from uh, from Le, Le Calandre, which is a three-star Michelin restaurant, once said to me, people don't understand that olive oil is not only uh, a fat to cook with, but it's a, a, flor- it's a, it's a flavor in mm-hmm. Of course, mm-hmm. absolutely. So if you have a good olive oil, the whole dish kind of sits. Yeah. It's like people when they yeah. say, when they say um, it needs more seasoning. It's like, no, it needs more salt. There's plenty of seasoning. Yeah. The salt is lacking to enhance that flavor. Right. It's the same way with olive oil. Because I think about it all the time. We'll sit there and I'll be, sometimes I'm in a rush. I love to cook at home when I have time. Um, but sometimes we're in a rush. We put the baby down. She was fussy. And it's now 8 o'clock, 8.30. And we're like, oh, all right, we just got to eat. And sometimes I'm just like, yeah. I was like, all this dish needs is some olive oil. That's mm-hmm. it. Because I'll look at my wife and she'll look at me. She'll, I'll be like, how is it? She's like, it's good. I'm like, you want some olive oil? She's like, yes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> olive oil fixes everything. Everything. Oh, it That's does. so funny. And the, and the funny thing I always tell people, you know, that you you prepare to put a gallon of, I don't know, $60, $70 oil in your car, but you're not prepared to put, you know, how much? Not even half, I tell half an ounce I tell of olive that. oil that uh, costs as much in your system. You exactly. Know? I tell people that all the time. It's... It's like putting, um, what do they say, regular unleaded than a Ferrari. You don't do it. Yeah. Premium fuel only. That's it. Uh, yeah, I'm kind of upset I didn't think about that. I just rinsed my glass of hot water, but yeah, I got I sparkling right here. Yeah. I mean, you still can. Well, how is it? How different is it now that it's been opened and it's a little warmer? Um, no, I mean, the... A little different? A little bit. It's pink now. <laughs> <laughs> now it's sparkling real good. <laughs> oh, that's so good. The acidity, I can't get over it. It's so delicious. It makes my mouth all water. What time are we running there right now? Because I know he's got a, a thing to go to. 4.15. 4.15. Okay. Oh, all right, we're good. We're going to Carter. Okay. All right, let's go on to the Vincenzo. Go Vincenzo. Carter, Carter 4.31. You drive or are you... Uh, no, I parked here. I had to extend my... Uh, oh, extend the time? Yeah. Extend the time. Yeah, they suck here. Truck, not here. The what? Truck. The truck? 
Chuck. 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 What Chuck? He's here somewhere. For a podcast. Oh, he's no here. Chuck. Chuck is with us. Okay. Oh, I was like, up. what? I don't know. Do you want Chuck. me to send him up? <laughs> yeah. Uh, sure. Yes or no? Yeah. 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 yeah send him okay. up. Yeah. It's fine. I was like, wait, I didn't book another podcast. <laughs> I thought Chef did for a second. That freaked me out. See? He works for He's with us. Oh, yeah, yeah. He's our uh, wine and spirit director. Oh, cool, cool, cool. Yeah. So, oh, Vincent. Vincent. Trebbiano, 70%. 15% Malvasia Bianca and 50% Canaiolo. Oh! So the color that you see is given by the Canaiolo oh. and, the, and the wood aging. Interesting. So we hang the grapes on rafters. We pick them when they ripen. So not overripe, just ripen, and we let them uh, hang for when they reach until they reach 350 grams of sugar. Um, I've never smelled a Vinsanto like that before. No. No, I mean, it's incredible. Why is it so nutty? That's not typical of Vinsanto. Yeah, I mean, for me, like I've never had. It's like a. It's almost sherry esque. Yeah. Like yeah. Like almonds and. Honey is that the col- uh, yeah. yeah, the canola? No, no, no. It's a, it's a process. Oh, it is. Okay. So why good. good. I cut you off. So please the, tell the, me about the, the process. oxidation. The oxidation process. Wow. That is incredible. Wow. Is this, it's still sweet. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Okay. But the 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 the, the, the Trebbiano, which is the what the French call Louis Blanc, the, right. the grape they use for brandy, of course, for cognac, it's the one that gives the backbone to the wine. Mm. So the backbone is done by the Trebbiano. Then you have uh, an addition of Canaiolo Malvasia Bianca that gives a little gentleness, and the Canaiolo adds fat. But you have to be careful with the Canaiolo because if you have to ma- add, add too much, then it, the wine tends to sit. And the aging of the wine is done in small barrels called caratelli, about 10, 10 12 gallons um, barrels, so small ones. And it's aged for 10 years. So to make this bottle of wine, you need eight pounds of grapes and 10 years of weight. For that little bottle? Yep. Eight. Goodness gracious. That explains why Vincenzo can be expensive. A lot of people don't want to spend the money on it because they think it's expensive. But then they'll go spend money on Sauterne, and I'm like, you're paying for the same. Oh, well, you're not paying for the same thing, but in it, ideally, you are. But I guess the name Sauterne versus Monsanto. That's crazy to me. That well, is. And so then good. also, Sauternes botrytized, and this is not right. There's no. No tries. No, no, if there is, it's not. Look, we're not looking for it. Right. It's right. Just, not intention. It may happen. Not intentional. Mm. And the advantage of the Monsanto being a wine obtained by process of oxidation versus a Sauternes, which is obtained by process of reduction, is that. Oxygen is not an issue. Oh, so you can right, keep right, a bottle right. half empty on your counter for weeks, months, nothing would happen to it. That's true. I do love being able to have it in my fridge at the restaurant for a month just in case nobody orders it. <laughs> it's nice. And it, it should be sold by the glass. That cheese is crazy. Yeah, that's um. What is that? I'm not super familiar. It's Italian? Mm-hmm. Well, it is, but it's, in, it is? it's from Barolo. Mm-hmm. Um, so oh, that's why I don't know about Testun it. Testun al Barolo. Testun. Testun? Testun. Is it cow? No. Yeah, okay. So it's Ubr- Ubriache? Ubriache. Ubriache. Yeah. So wow. with, the, with the skins of the... Oh, the, Nebbiolo's on there. Yep, so those are Nebbiolo grapes. Skin of, skin of Nebbiolo. Dude, that is insane. It's pretty good. Again, wow. shout out Capella cheese. Uh, yeah. If you're looking for nerdy cheese, that's... I know, I saw them opened up. I still got to go there. I was like, at first when they opened, it was right after we... Um, well, I don't know if it was after we opened Bastone or when we, like, mm. we were a good bit in announcing sure, that we were doing sure. Bastone. And because of the pandemic and everything, it got pushed back and pushed back and pushed back. But everyone was so excited for a, a mozzarella bar because we, we stretch it to order and all that. And then the, the, I saw they uh, them pop up and I was mm. like, they stole our thunder, <laughs> you know? Well, but I was like, no, nah, they probably were planning to do it, too. Because well, they do stretch mozzarella there, too, right? Yeah, but it's yeah. also more of a shop and less, it's not No, a it's not a restaurant. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. But I remember I, I sent it to Pat and I go, oh, look, here we go. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but now they are, this is, this is a great little spread. That is, I wow. almost dropped the board. I wasn't expecting, I didn't know it was real marble. Oh, I picked no, it up and I was like, yeah, oh, yeah. I was like, <laughs> Rachel too, she was like, this is really heavy. But no, everything's been really good from that. I really enjoy it, especially the, the goat cheese. I still haven't like gotten into it, but I was telling Richard before we started recording, I accidentally dipped my knuckle in it when I was unwrapping it. Yeah. And then I licked off my knuckle, and it was it's, so good. It's high acid, too. God, oh, yeah. Great. And then... Um, oh, that's also from Piedmont. Yeah, it's all okay. old Piedmont piece. Uh, apart from the Pecorino, which is just Right, right. Yeah. And the reason why it's called Vincent... Well, the, pr- the prosciutto is to- Toscano, too. Prosciutto yeah. Toscano, yeah. Okay. Well, it's prosciutto salato, I believe, is Toscano. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Um, 
the reason why it's called Bin Santo Holy Wine because it was used in, in um, for sacraments, so right. it was used in church. Mm. So the people, the priest could keep it in the sacristy uh, for weeks, and the wine would not get spoiled because it was already oxidized. So you know, unless he was Irish, you could use it for multiple masses. So, um, speaking of oxidized wine, since we're on this, before we're going to wrap it up and, and all that, did you know, nobody has it in this state, unfortunately, but you probably know this, but you know Vernaccio uh, di San Gimignano? Mm-hmm. There's a Vernaccio in Sardinia yeah, that's made, yeah, the Oristano that's made into an oxidized wine. Mm. I can't find it anywhere. Delicious. Mm. Yeah, I've heard it's incredible. Very good. Yeah. Contini. Contini? Contini is the one. That, okay. Is it the, the same grape or they just call it Vernaccio? It's actually, it's a, no, it's, it's, a, it's probably a distant cousin. I'm sure. Yeah, sure, sure. It's the same. yeah, but I remember reading about it and I reached out to every single rent. Yeah. Nobody yeah. has it. Nobody has it. But you have to look up uh, on uh, online who has Contini. Okay. I'll do Spelled Contini, but the accent is on the... Right, Contini. Contini. Okay. Yeah, that is one I've Ooh. been dying to try. And I was in New York. They probably had it there, and I totally forgot to think about it. Because as a wine guy in Georgia, we're st- I always tell people we're still in our infancy, especially with Italian wine. Um, so when I went to New York, I grabbed everything I could. Right. Wrapped it up in clothes, put it in the yeah. bag, checked the bag, and all that. But I didn't think to look for a yeah. nacho. Well, the nacho is sano for a lychee, but if you do a tuge <sighs> and that kind of stuff. Yeah, oh. exactly, and that's why yeah, I, that's, that's, that's why I looked for it. I was like, oh, a lychee's yeah. opening up. This it's is like a manzanilla, right? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. In style, yeah, a little more depth than a manzanilla. We have a, like a manzanilla. we have a Sardinian vermouth from, or a vermouth from a Sardinia, uh, Silvio Carta. Oh, yeah. that stuff's killer. Mm. Oh man, that's good. So, that's like the only thing. It's the only option I got right now until I find <laughs> the other stuff. Yeah, but, um, well, this was fantastic. Yeah. I Thank really, really much. appreciate Thank it. You for having and I'm glad, I'm glad you guys enjoyed this. At least I hope. No, it's amazing. No, so yeah. I know Richard was excited yeah. to be on. He yes. was like, Sebastiano's gonna love it. This is gonna be great. Um, is there anything you, as a speaker for the world of Chianti, would like to tell the viewers or any Americans in general about Chianti that always maybe? check for the chicken. Always check for the rooster. Got always it. Always check for the chicken. Black chicken. Always a black rooster. Look for that. That's the will we'll tell you that if it's a real deal or not. So how um how in like to you guys how important is that? The black rooster. Yeah, because there's some black roosters where fundamental. I'm, fundamental. Yeah, because I've had some where I'm like, eh, it's okay, but then you know like yours and other people I'm like, oh, that's so good. Yeah, but, I don't know. As an I think the appellation the Kent Classic appellation on average. Is the one of the appellation that delivers the best wine in Italy right now? Awesome, right now, yes. Awesome. I agree. Yeah. <laughs> uh, Richard, anything you'd like to leave them with? Uh, no, I appreciate y'all having us, uh, especially for these. You know, it's always nice having new products that haven't quite met the market and getting people like you excited about them. Yeah. So um, it helps us test and keep our finger on the pulse of what people are drinking, and there's no better place to do it than here. So. Thank you for that. Oh, thanks, man. I appreciate it. Of course. Guys, thank you for watching. This has been, might be one of my favorite episodes we've done so far. Cheese, Especially because yeah. I had food. That's always good. <laughs> we always wanted food, but we always are too busy, and then we just go right into drinking wine. So uh, this was awesome. Guys, thank you for watching. Have a great day. Thank you. Thank you.